Welcome to The Meaning of Catholic. This is Timothy Flanders. I'm joined today by Charles Moskowitz. Charles, how you doing, brother? Very good, Timothy. Thanks for having me aboard. Absolutely, yeah. Happy to have you. Looking forward to the conversation. Charles Moskowitz is an award-winning veteran radio talk show host who presently hosts the Charles Muskowitz podcast on YouTube and subscribing podcast platforms. Muskowitz is the author of over a dozen nonfiction books, including The Nazi Connection to Islamic Terrorism, published by WND Books. Columns by the Boston author have been published in the Boston Globe, the Washington Times, WND, Newsmax.com, and Front Page. So I'm talking to Charles today. The, the subject of our conversation is the Mosaic Law in, among Jews as well as Catholics. So mm -hmm. we'll be discussing that today. But we want to go over a few basic things about Judaism 101, especially for my viewers, understanding Judaism historically and at present day, I think there's a lot of misinformation. So we're going to get it straight from the horse's mouth here. <laughs> and uh, Charles, you, you mentioned it before we went on the air that you consider yourself a traditional Jew. Can you explain that term and what that means to you? And you said that you're a member of a conservative and an Orthodox synagogue. Tell us about that. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, by traditional Jew, you know, it's more of the conventional form of Judaism. It's not specifically a part of any denomination. I think that Judaism starting in the uh, maybe the late 18th century, early 19th century, in some ways began to imitate the Protestant movements in that we became denominational. All of a sudden you had like reform Judaism, conservative Judaism, and suddenly to be um, Orthodox really, you know, became a, a literally a hierarchical structure as opposed to what it had been previous, which is just conventional Judaism. And, uh, you know, you could say that Orthodox Judaism might be comparable to Orthodox Catholicism in that it's, uh, you know, the, the sort of the more formal, more official understanding of the faith um, as, as it's been propagated for millennia. And that uh, in that sense, I suppose I'm Orthodox with a small O in that I look to the Orthodox rabbinic tradition for my understanding of my faith and for advice and guidance. Um, but I'm not Orthodox with a capital O in that I subscribe to the Orthodox denomination. And I think in that sense, I am probably similar to most Israelis today in that in Israel, whether or not, regardless of their level of observance or faith, they generally look to the quote, Orthodox Jewish uh, principles as their guide for what Judaism is. They're not into denominational Judaism. That's become more of an American phenomena that emanated out of the Enlightenment in Europe, but also was something that I think was influenced by the Protestant Reformation. That's very interesting. So yeah, it's when you look up Judaism, you certainly get sort of a three branch denominationalism. Uh, and that's very interesting because what I was reading about was that among the quote unquote Orthodox, there's many different sort of branches of that tradition, whether that's Ashkenazi or Ethiopian or what have you going all over the place to Russian, uh, your background. So from what I understand, the reform Jewish, Jewish movement or denomination, what have you, is essentially a very progressive and um, very uh what catholics might call modernist they don't they don't really it sounds like they don't even believe in really the holy scripture even it happened mm -hmm. uh they don't have really have they believe that um mosaic law should only be observed according to just ethical commandments right uh, not any sort of ritual commandments and then uh the conservatives were sort of a reaction to that to try to find some kind of middle ground between sort of being more modern and being sort of ultra liberal is that a good um, understanding of the, re the reform on the one hand and the conservative on the other? Yes. I mean, I think that the equivalent, the Christian equivalent of reform might be the Unitarian movement. You know, uh, I think that uh, like in the Unitarian, Unitarians amongst very, very liberal Protestant movements, they view Jesus as nothing more than a, a great teacher. They, they deny the divinity element. And I think in Reform Judaism, you don't necessarily even have belief in a divine creator of the universe and lawgiver. It's more that um, they look to the Torah and the scriptures as 
moral and ethical guides, but not as having been divine writ, having been, uh, you know, literal in, in their interpretation. So it, it was, in a sense, a reformation that occurred within Judaism. And that, yes, the uh, conservatives try to straddle both sides of the fence. And in a way, I think they're starting to lose ground because uh, Orthodox Judaism is growing, as is reform. Hmm. Okay, so you mentioned to me by email, you said that left-wing Jews control the high ground of American Jewish culture. Yes. So in terms of um, at least American Jewry, or maybe also the world, um, what, uh, so you're saying the left-wing Jews, are you talking about the reform Jews then, when you say left-wing yes. Jews? Well, okay. re right. I mean, reform or perhaps conservative, I, I mean more of a Jewish establishment, certainly in the United States probably in most of the rest of the world that is very much politically on the left. They're kind of, I would describe them as more socialist than Jewish. Um, and that uh, they really have captured the high ground of Jewish culture, Jewish, you know, life, even Jewish faith, and, and have been in, in that high ground for probably at least a century now. Um, and, uh, and yet there's a lot of pushback from a growing Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox movement, particularly in the state of Israel, that is also growing rapidly. And um, you know, there is concern, I don't think it'll come to this, that there might be a, a literally a civil conflict within that could result in a literal civil war. But uh, you do have two competing strains um, within Judaism, and unfortunately, it's very fractured. Well, it's very interesting, I think, because I think many Catholics, when they think or talk about the Jews, quote unquote, they're they're thinking really only of sort of the Marxist Jews, essentially, or the left wing right. Jews. Um, so this I really interested to hear more about that. Um, I want to get further into Jewish Judaism 101, though, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the observance of Mosaic law. So as I understand it, the the rabbinic Jewish tradition, as opposed to Second ten Temple Judaism, has a uh, oral Torah and a written Torah. Correct. And the oral Torah is written down eventually in the Talmud. Mostly, and, yes. Mostly. And there's also other commentaries that come later. Um, but that forms that the, the Talmud and the Torah, the Pentateuch, as we would Catholics would call the first five books of the Bible, mm -hmm. um, together those, those things form the halakha, which is the all of the different commandments that Jews do. Mm -hmm. So not not only in the Mosaic law per se, but also in this oral Torah that is then written down in the Talmud. Is that a good understanding of rabbinic Judaism in general? Yes. I mean, the oral Torah, the, uh, you know, the Shabbat Pei, um, was eventually codified uh, by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanazi, the rabbi, the Judah, the priest, this happened uh, during the Roman emperor, uh, Marcus Aurelius, that's when it started. In fact, he collaborated with Aurelius, um, who was the author of Reflections. And that the idea was that after the defeat of the Bar Kokhba rebellion and the destruction of Jerusalem, when Jews were no longer allowed into Jerusalem, there was a movement to codify what had been oral law that goes all the way back to really to Sinai as a way to sort of preserve and, and advance uh, the, the Jewish faith and, and something that would essentially uh, translate to uh, things like uh, synagogue, like uh, temple worship, so that it could still be practiced in a form that would take place until the rebuilding of the temple or the third temple in the future. And um, thus you had the development of the Talmudic system it's really precedes that. I mean, it goes back to really the Babylonian period and, and um, the uh, return of the Jews by the, uh, the Persian emperor Darius, who was called um, the Messiah because he actually wrote a decree that's published in the Pentateuch for Catholics. That's the book of Ezra, where he writes, puts in writing that he tells the Jews to go back to Judea rebuild their temple, reestablish their commonwealth. And it was at that point that you had the development of the 
what we call the oral law in a more practical sense. The movement would eventually become known as the Pharisaic movement. And then with the uh, development of the Talmud and the Sanhedrin, it would, it would be more formalized and more codified. And it continues on to this day where you have rabbis who are qualified. And when I say qualified, that's an interesting definition who are, are able to write responsa and who are able to continue to understand Jewish law, the goal of which is to understand the will of God, to understand the logos of God, if, to use a Catholic term, um, and to apply that to everyday life and all of the ethics that are associated with that. Yeah, and talking about the oral law, I think there is certainly evidence in Ezra because there's the story, I was trying to find the, the uh, verse, but there's the story, I believe it's Ezra and Josiah. Ezra and explain, Nehemiah. I'm sorry, uh, Nehemiah? Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't remember who it was who explains the law to the people because there's a story in Ezra or Nehemiah, I can't remember which one, but they, yeah. they read the law and then they explain it. So there is an exactly. oral explanation. That, that was the beginning. It's when yeah. Ezra stood up in front of the entire congregation, upheld the Torah scrolls, it was an experience that was it happened with with like thousands of people who had gone to Jerusalem. It was the rededication of the second temple. And then that launched, in a sense, the, the program of education. And uh, really, they, they, they almost you could say that they were the founders of the concept of public education. And during the period of the, the Maccabean period, the Hasmonean emperors, you had a great advancement of that where education was eventually brought to young people. And uh, you had a system put in place that would become part of the society where education became key. And since then, of course, education is very, very important to Jews. You know, that's one of the keystones to being a Jew, to understand the workings of the world, both secular and religious. Can you elaborate on what you said previously about the logos of god i think that catholic viewers will be interested to hear your your take on what it means for the pharisaic tradition of the oral torah to transmit the logos of god okay i mean i think that the pharisees were very influenced by greek knowledge i mean midrashic commentary and this is strictly legend holds that Aristotle himself studied with the rabbis or uh, Alexander the Great did after he uh, occupied uh, Judea on his way back from Egypt. And that uh, the idea was the, the merge which really came more to the fore with Philos, Jude uh, Philos of, the, of Alexandria of Jewish faith in God and reason and, and logic which was the Greek contribution of, of, of Plato and Aristotle and the great Greek thinkers. And, and an understanding in a sense of how society should function, how society should act within a context of absolute truths that emanate from Sinai. It was kind of like a, in a sense, not a dialectic, but more of a, a synthesis of, of faith and reason. And I know that for Christianity, it's expressed in the, the book of John, where he talks about Jesus representing the Logos, which I have enormous amount of respect for. But in, in, in the practical sense, it, it is similar in that there is this belief, and this is something that I think Judaism actually has more in common with Catholicism than other Christian sects, or at least Protestant sects, in that we, we're both a, a religion of faith and works. You know, we, we have a belief in a creator of the universe, in the lawgiver, but we also understand that that has to be synthesized with the nature of the creation and understanding that both in its physical and abstract forms. You know, it's not just enough to identify and name by name the, the, the elements of the world, but it's to understand the concepts and the ideas that, that emanate from that as well, which are not physical. And those are more spiritual. Those are things like love. Those are things like you know, I mean, the human relations and all of the nuances that, that, are, that are within it and things like a, the establishment of uh, proper governments to protect those understandings and advance them. So would you say that uh, Philo and other, perhaps Maimonides, uh, other Jewish philosopher thinkers 
are firmly in line with the classical realist tradition of Aristotle and Plato? I mean, certainly in the case of both of them, yes. I mean, Maimonides was the, was the author of Guide to the Perplexed, which was about a further synthesis of Jewish understanding with Aristotelian metaphysics. And I also understand that um, Maimonides had, a, had an exchange of, uh, of correspondence with um, St. Thomas Aquinas, yes, who was in a sense the father of modern uh, logos. I mean, the, the modern uh, Catholic understanding of, of similar ideas. Right. So I, I'd like, this is, I never ask you about this, but um, I know you've talked with E. Michael Jones before, and I know that his, his basic thesis is that Jews rejected Jesus Christ, who is the logos incarnate. So therefore there, there is a certain element of irrationality within the Jewish tradition. What I'm sure you're familiar with this, his whole thesis. What, what is your uh, five minute ele elevator speech on, on your take on that? <laughs> Well, well, first of all, I have an enormous amount of respect for Dr. E. Michael Jones. I've interviewed him many times. I actually am still reading his book, Logos Rising, which is great. Unfortunately, he says very little about Jews in it, I will have to say, but it's, it's a tremendous work of intellectual force, and it does really lay out and present the Christian view of Logos. Um, you know, look, I do, this is where... Christianity and Judaism, you know, diverge. I mean, we don't agree on this. Um, we uh, believe that Christianity is a form of Judaism that has done something that Judaism actually never was able to do, which brings up the question of actually the divinity of Jesus. It certainly indicates that he very well may have been the Messiah because his ministry resulted in the promulgation of Judaic law and Judaic ethics to most of the rest of the world. Judaism never quite was able to do that. So in that sense, I mean, I tend to embrace the, the, the grafted in theory um, of the dual covenant. And that certainly the Christian covenant is valid because of that, if for that factor alone. But having said that, the Jewish understanding is quite different in many, many respects. It is also quite valid. Jesus himself noticed this and, and stated it in the book of Matthew, where he says that the covenant between God and the children of Israel is forever. And there are some other passages that indicate that as well. And at the same time, he represents a new covenant. So, I mean, it seems like it's kind of paradoxical, and I know that it is, but to me, it makes sense that both are valid. And that both maybe uh, yet there's a reason why the Lord God, King of the universe, has maintained the Jewish people as a separate people. Our mission remains valid. We are, we have a role in the universe still. And I think that it's actually playing out more significantly today. And particularly since the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 and the establishment of Jerusalem as the capital in 1967. Well, it's, it's very interesting. I'm very surprised to hear you say that. I didn't expect you to have hold that view, and we never talked about this particular point. Um, so you, are you saying, just so I understand you, are you saying that for the Christians, Jesus Christ is the Messiah from God, from the true God, to bring them to the true God, whereas for the Jews, the covenant that God gave to them is still valid and, as it was when it was given at Sinai. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I mean, it seems to be the case. I mean, both covenants essentially fulfill the covenant of God, which is that the people of the world must know God as individuals and as groups. And that the entire mission of Judaism is to know God. And then once we do know God, to serve as a, as a light unto the rest of the nations of the world so that the entire world comes to know God. We've been walking with God for a long time. I mean, you know, it goes back millennia before Jesus. We were walking with God and struggling with this and going up and down. I mean, if you look at the entire narrative of the Torah, we get closer to God and our nation thrives and we're, we're, we raise the level spiritually because we're fulfilling God's laws. And then when we fall away from God and we fall into idolatrous practices and evil, then we suffer and that we, we, we end up 
you know, burning and we end up with destruction. And yet we're tempted by all of the things that draw us away from God, all the, which is unnatural, as, as, as is all of humanity. And so there's a vested interest, I think, for all of humanity, but certainly within Judaism, that we know God and all of God's commands and God's moral and ethical precepts as a way of raising our spiritual level, both as a people in and of ourselves, but as a light unto the nations. Interesting. Okay. So how is this um, a traditional Jewish view? It sounds like this is, yes. it seems. This is the very core of Judaism. I mean, the, the dual covenant, I mean, is that no. traditionally held? No, it's not. And nor is okay. it traditional for Christians either. This is something that most Jews and most Christians will never agree on. I personally embrace it, but I don't think that most Jews or Christians will accept that. And I understand that. I don't have a problem with that. That's a matter of faith. It just, to me, it seems to make sense that, that both covenants are real and that both covenants are valid. Okay. So we talked just a moment ago about logos and faith and reason. How can Jesus Christ be both the Messiah and not the Messiah? Well, I mean, look, the Jewish understanding, uh, if we must go there, I mean, I'll certainly talk about that. And that is that the Jewish understanding of Messiah is quite different in that we believe that the Messiah is not God, not son of God. Messiah is a man, maybe a woman, I don't know, who basically comes into the world at a time when the Jewish people had reached a level of spirituality that they were prepared to receive the Messiah and that the Messiah then reigns over the Jewish people and launches a, a, a millennia of peace and a millennia of, of faith and advancement. Not a uh, necessarily a, uh, a spiritual being. I mean, that, that I think is a Christian innovation. I am not saying that to be in any way questioning that. Or no, criticizing. Okay. Yeah. I just, I, I want to be careful about this. Sure. I, I mean, it, <coughs> it sounds like um, you're not very easily offended, Charles, and I, I'm certainly not uh, offended. So certainly you can well, these are rather speak your mind. Well, yeah, I understand. But um, I, I was just in, very intrigued. I, I didn't expect you to say that, that dual covenant theory. Um, well, dual covenant yeah. in that I believe that the, the Christian innovation of Jesus as son of God and as God according to the book of John, is a, is a very positive and brilliant innovation, one that I don't accept as a Jew. But I, I think that it's certainly within the context of a covenant because it leads Christians to believe in the Torah. It leads okay. Christians to believe in the moral and ethical precepts that God created and gave the world at Sinai. So for that reason, I think that it's valid. Okay, so you're using the term valid. Would you... I mean, are, are you saying that the Christian covenant through Jesus Christ as son of God, God and man, is true? No, but okay. I'm saying that the covenant itself is true. And I, another source I would point to is when St. Paul, after having visited the Agora in, or I think it was after being in Antioch, he was told by Jewish authorities at that time that they felt that he was going too far in terms of proselytizing to the Gentiles and that he needed to go back to Jerusalem to talk with the, um, the early Christian heads of the church, particularly St. James, who was a devout Jew and who I believe headed the Christian church after the crucifixion for something like 25, 30 years. And to, to get instruction in terms of how to proceed in his outreach to the Gentiles. And so my understanding is that he went back to Jerusalem. He met with St. James and with others. And they basically, in a nutshell, and you're, you're the expert here, so please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't, I don't mean to like impose here. But my understanding is that he was then basically instructed to go ahead with his mission as long as he taught and adhered to the Noahide laws, what we now know as the Noahide laws, even though that is a more modern rabbinic extraction, it was generally understood at the time that those existed. And that if, if Paul incorporated that into the teaching, 
then he could go ahead and proselytize to the Gentile nations. Yeah, that, that basically right. It's essentially that the Gentiles were being baptized and the Jewish apostles made the decision, they adjudicated the Mosaic law, which is which we'll, which we'll get into. Um, they, took, they, they claimed the authority to adjudicate the Mosaic law regarding the Gentiles. Essentially, that's the, right. the fundamental. So they, they said that the, the fullness of the commandments of the Torah are not to be imposed on the Gentiles. They are not to be circumcised. Right. They are to be baptized. And that's the, um, the engrafting into the covenant that is the right. right. Um, yeah. So, well, let me, um, I want to get back to Ezra in a minute and some of the oral Torah. So you're saying that the, just so I understand that the dual covenant, um, so you're saying the dual covenant the covenant for Christians is not true in saying that you're not saying that it is true that Jesus is the son of God. Right. You're simply saying that it is valid in the sense that it's a positive thing for the Gentiles to turn from idolatry to the Mosaic law through Jesus Christ. That's, that's right. Because okay. of the <clears throat> embrace of the Mosaic covenant and all of its moral and ethical precepts, for that reason, I would argue that it is a valid covenant. Regardless okay. of and, and and the belief in Jesus does not contradict any of that. So to my way of thinking, that's perfectly appropriate. In fact, I'd encourage Christians to in in that. I think it brings them closer to the covenant. Okay, so you so you view it as simply a means for Gentiles to believe in something that's not true, but ultimately has a good benefit. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I don't want to say not true because I mean that's I would never come out and say that. I mean, Jesus very well may be the Messiah. I'm not here to say uh, that he's not. I, I would simply say that the belief in Jesus does not contradict the covenant of the Torah, and therefore it's, it, it's, 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 it's a positive thing. Okay. Um, it's not in my position to say whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. That is a Christian question. Okay. Interesting. Well, thank you. This is all very fascinating. Um, I, I'm wondering what your take is on a number of passages that I'm sure that I, I sent to you um, just regarding the Jeremiah saying, I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant I made with your fathers, indicating mm -hmm. Mount Sinai. Uh, Isaiah says that the Torah will go from Mount Zion. Um, Moses says another prophet will arise like me. All nations will come and grab a Jew, Zechariah. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I see, I, as I said to you, I see them as fulfilled in Jesus Christ as being true because of these prophecies. How does, how does the Orthodox, how do you view these, these sayings in the Tanakh? Well, I mean, first of all, I have an enormous amount of respect for the belief that these particular passages in the, in the prophets, in the writings, in the Torah, um, are viewed by Christians as proof texts to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. The Jewish understanding is very different. And I, I would simply say that um, we have been holding these texts. They are our texts. And we have a very different view of their ultimate meaning. We don't believe that they've been manifested yet. Um, it's just that simple. I mean, we have, a if you study rabbinic understanding and it goes very deep and it's well beyond my intellectual knowledge there is is very interesting and very profound and very diverse understandings of what all of these texts mean it's just a different understanding than the christian understanding always has been and always probably will be okay yeah sure that's certainly a different understanding um i want to go back to ezra real quick which goes into the, the what you were mentioning about um, the book of Acts in St. Paul, because the other aspect about observance of Mosaic law, which is forms the distinction between so-called second temple Judaism and rabbinic Judaism, which we've discussed in terms of the oral Torah and the written Torah. And that is when, so when the Jews come back from Babylon in the book of Ezra, chapter three, Mm -hmm. It speaks of how they reinstated immediately, they reinstated the Aaronic priesthood and the sacrifice 
as it is written in the Torah of Moses, mm-hmm. Ezra 3.2. And this, this is before the temple is constructed. So they immediately reinstate the cultic rite of the animal sacrifice for the atonement of sins. So, but uh, after the destruction of the second temple, during the formative period of Pharisaic Judaism or rabbinic Judaism, there is not a reinstitution of the Aaronic priesthood in the sacrifice. This right. is the part that I don't understand about the observance of Mosaic law. Can you help, help me understand what, what's going on there? Well, I mean, it's my understanding that the Talmud codified um, essentially a means to observe without the literal uh, temple worship. Uh, instead, you know, we have like rituals, very elaborate rituals in some cases, around the uh, around the holy days and around the uh, Shabbos, around the uh, around Sabbath, dealing with wine and dealing with uh, certain types of blessed breads like challah, and uh, that these things essentially represent synagogue, uh, represent temple worship. Uh, we still have in place the priestly sect in that people who often have the last name that, that is a variation of Cohen are descended from the Kohanim. Now, I don't know if there's been any DNA research on that, but it would be interesting to see, um, especially since my wife has that ancestry. Oh, okay. um, and, uh, and also the Levites who were the, uh, of which the Kohanim came. If you hear someone who has a last name similar to Levine or Levin, they might have ancestry to the Levites, which also worked as, you know, on, as workers at the uh, temple. And that there are different holidays where people who have that ancestry go before the, the, the Torah at the synagogue and they say certain benedictions and certain prayers. So I guess that what I'm saying is that the, the scaffolding, the infrastructure has continued even if we don't literally have the temple to continue with temple worship. Um, You know, even the ritual slaughter of animals for, for kosher, there's an element of that. We continue with tithing. We continue with, uh, you know, mitzvahs. We continue with uh, a lot of the uh, practices that surround a temple worship. And we're doing it in lieu of the eventual emergence of a new temple, which of course is a very controversial subject today, but we believe and we pray that that will happen. Right. Okay. Now, this is a side side note before we get into the authority question. Now, do Jews today, which as you're, as you're pointing out, would essentially be Judahites, Benjaminites, and Levites in terms of the tribes, traditional tribes, now, there is a Mosaic law which says that they don't intermarry back when there was 12 of them. Now, is that, how is that understood? Is that still practiced? Do, do, do Jews distinguish today between Judahites, Benjamites, and Levites? No. I mean, first of all, well, I shouldn't say flat out no, in that I think that history indicates that uh, during the period after, after Solomon, when the empire divided into the northern and southern kingdoms, you still had a lot of intermingling and a lot of Israel, Israelites moved south into Judah and assimilated into the Judean population. Um, and so, you know, in the practical sense, I, I'm not sure that that still stands. Although if you look at very Orthodox Jews, ultra Orthodox, there are some things about Kohanim and Levites not marrying outside of their sect and there were some remnants of, of that particular practice. That's not, I don't think in the formal sense, still done, it's not disavowed. You know, I'm not, I'm, not cond- I'm not in any way contradicting it, like a lot of Jewish laws. But I think that in, in, the, in the reality, it's, it's, uh, it hasn't been in place, probably for millennia at least. Oh, okay. So, Okay, so getting, I mean, this really brings up with both the Aaronic priesthood and that particular law that's in the Mosaic law. 
it's really a it seems to me that the dispute between catholics and jews would be essentially just a question of authority because if if we go back to the book of acts and the destruction of the second temple the church is essentially claiming the authority to adjudicate the mosaic law based on that yeshua is the new moses he's the new lawgiver right um so my question is what is because at the time there were multiple parties of Jews. There's not only the Pharisees, obviously, but the Sadducees and the Essenes and various sects within Judaism. What is the uh, basis of the Pharisees' authority to adjudicate the law against the Sadducees or the Christians? How do you, how do you see that? Well, well, first of all, I think that Judaism is Pharisaic Judaism because the rabbinic movement emerged out of the Pharisaic movement. I would even suggest, and maybe this is controversial, and I, I, I haven't claimed to have heard this. I, I mentioned this in my book, by the way, God is God, that Jesus himself was a Pharisee, um, that he was of the school of thought, which was emerging at that time, which was developing practical laws to live by, and which was, in a sense, beginning to move away from the temple. The temple was under the control of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were I would, I would compare them today to the highly secularized, even socialistic Jews. You know, they were, you know, they were um, very Hellenized, first of all. And that, um, th you know, th there was almost a, a conflict, almost a civil war between them and the Pharisees who remained religious. And that goes back to Judah Maccabee himself, who was, you could describe as a Pharisee. I mean, he was he was, uh, you know, involved not only in a war against the against Antiochus, the Syrian Greek emperor, but also a, an internal civil war within Judaism between the religious Jewish movement that he led, and by doing so, not only did he save Judaism, but he established modern concepts of sovereign of, so, of the sovereignty of nations. But also between the, him and his movement, the the Hasmoneans and the Hellenized Jews of his day, who had fallen away from the religion, who were engaged in pagan practices. I don't know if they were outright pagan worshipers, but you know, they were doing things, you know, nude wrestling and just stuff that they found abhorrent at the time. Right. And a lot of that has to do with the whole Hanukkah story. The rebellion against the Greeks was also a war against these highly secularized Jews who really controlled the temple and did so right up till the end. Right. Okay. So, and that, that brings up, I'm uh, glad you brought up Maccabees because it makes me think of, I believe it's first Maccabees. Well, it says that they're, when they're cleansing the altar um, from these Hellenized, Hellenized uh, pollutions, they say they, they set the altar aside and the text says that they set it aside until a prophet should arise to tell us what to do, basically. So mm -hmm. the idea being that only a prophet has the authority to adjudicate the Mosaic law in this case. Um, is there, did the Pharisees ever claim that a prophet spoke to them or there was some kind of miraculous authority that they were given to adjudicate the law? As you said, it, there's no literal Aaronic priesthood or right. Did they claim any authority like that? Well, well, first of all, I think that in Jewish tradition, the prophets really ended at the time of the Babylonian captivity. I think the last prophets went into captivity with the Babylonians. Um, my understanding, and I could be wrong about this, is that one or two of them actually did come back with Ezra and Nehemiah to reestablish the Jewish commonwealth. But um, the Haggai age of prophecy, Zechariah, yeah. was it? Okay. Haggai and Zechariah, yeah. There you go. So the age of prophecy kind of ended at that point there really hasn't been a prophet. And one of the messages of the, the book of Esther, which is the Purim story, is that it was observed at the time that God himself had somewhat receded from the active and literal communication with the, the Judeans uh, that had existed at the time of the first commonwealth. And that, uh, that, that has been the condition ever since, that we, we don't have that kind of direct um, connection with God anymore. Now, I'm not saying that we may not have it in the future, but 
you know, th that whole era sort of came to an end with the destruction of the first temple or shortly afterward. Okay, so you're saying that Jews today, or Orthodox Jews say today that we, we are in the period that began after the Babylonian exile, in terms of God speaking in that, to- In that regard, In terms yeah. of prophets, okay. That's right. Okay. Um, so there is a, a sense that you're saying that the Pharisees sort of, sort of come to the conclusion that the Aaronic priesthood should not be reinstated and the, and the cult reinstated with even without the temple. They just sort of come to the conclusion that that is the case because there's no, God is not speaking. Is no, I, I think they, they did reinstate the Aaronic um, priesthood. After the second temple, I mean. Right. Well, even after the second temple, as I just mentioned, you still have certain special status for Kohanim and Le Leviim within temple worship, within synagogue worship. And, uh, you know, we still, in a sense, fulfill or carry out many of the rituals of the temple in lieu of the temple. So I, I don't think that they walked away from that at all. It just basically refashioned it in a way that's practical and that we can continue with at a time when our temple had been destroyed and our commonwealth had been destroyed. Okay. Well, let me ask you one last question about the rites. Um, because of what you're saying is there is, there is a, there is a ritual practice in Orthodox Judaism in lieu of the temple. Um, if the, the right of the atonement in Leviticus, uh, Vaikra 16, I believe, um, obviously the scapegoat and everything, there is a day of atonement ritual. Um, does Orthodox Judaism, the, the text of the Mosaic law says that the high priest will make atonement for the community. There is an atonement. There is an actual forgiveness of sins. Right. Are you saying, is, does Orthodox Judaism assert that the day of atonement forgives your sins? Yes, but we reenact it without the, temp the, the physical temple. We reenact it through the service of the Yom Kippur and uh, the fasting and, and the various particular prayers that we, we intone and, uh, and the, the type of study that we do on that day. And that our contention is that that is the day that the Lord God, the King of the universe is closest to the earth and it is the moment, one moment out of the year that we, we can ask forgiveness of our sin. We can atone for our sin. And when, when in, in the Jewish concept, when you atone for sin, uh, particularly starting in the Holy Week, the high holidays of, of, of Rosh Hashanah, it doesn't just mean that you ask someone for forgiveness. You have to do something to compensate. You know, we have this, you know, the Jews are very legalistic in that way. You're supposed to make some kind of a, a, a compensation, whether it be maybe an exchange of money or something, you know, that can represent. In a way, it's, it's one of those things that gets into the beginning of, of a modern judicial system in that you cannot literally, uh, you know, compensate for a sin if you have harmed someone else because it's in the past, it's happened, it's over. But you have to find a way in order to get some kind of atonement and some kind of forgiveness to ask that person to forgive you and then to do something to alleviate or at least recognize the nature of that sin. And, and then of course, ultimately, the real atonement for the sin can only happen on judgment day. You know, when, when, we, uh, when we meet our maker, so to speak, in which case our lives and our sins and our accomplishments are weighed and measured. But, um, you know, it, it's an interesting uh, process uh, uh, in that week. And it's a very powerful one too. I mean, in terms of um, really examining your life in the past year and then it gives you a chance moving forward to start again and to try to be closer to God and to try to be more spiritual in the coming year. Uh, it makes me think of the, the passage in the Gospels where Jesus Christ forgives sins and then he enters into a dispute with the Pharisees of the day who say to him, only God can forgive sins. Right. So obviously God instituted the day of atonement in the Levitical priesthood 
are you saying that God instituted the modern day of atonement so that God could forgive your sins through the modern version of that? I guess so. I mean, only God can forgive sins, right? I mean, that's, uh, and of course, if you believe that Jesus is God, then you can get forgiveness of sin through belief in Jesus, at least as an intermediary to God. But uh, ultimately, yes, it is God who forgives sins. I mean, at least in my understanding. And that you have to, you know, you know, we are created in the image of God. We're not God. And so we have to do what we can in our limited lifetime with the limited grant of, that God's given us, our limited sovereignty, to try to rectify sin as we commit it and to try to do better because we're all sinners. Absolutely. Well, I want to shift to talking more about modern situations. You mentioned about left-wing Jews having control of the high ground. Yes. Um, I guess one one question is, what is the role of Marxism in Judaism or Judaism and Marxism? You mentioned that you, you said that the Marxists are really, the Jewish Marxists, that is, you said that they're not really Jews. Can you elaborate on that? Well, first of all, I'm not saying they're not really Jews in the ethnic sense, okay. or even in necessarily in the religious sense. I would say that they're not good Jews. <laughs> okay. You know, they're they're uh, fallen Jews. They're you know they're they're in apostasy, um, in that they've embraced, or they've misinterpreted Jewish ideas more like, that uh, that have applied them in a way that is heretical to Jew to conventional Judaism, and uh, in a sense they've taken Jewish concepts like tikkun olam, which is to repair the world through belief in God and through doing good works and being spiritual. And they've, they've replaced that with a, with a godless approach to that, which if you take God away and you take you know, the creator away, then you have man literally striving to create an earthly utopia by changing human nature, which is of course the very basic definition of Marxism. And right. that this is a heresy in Judaism, it's a heresy in Christianity too. Um, but it, it took a, it, it really captivated Judaism for reasons that are very interesting and uh, very complex. And um, it's corrupted, I would suggest, a large part of the Jewish body. And it's harmed us, not only spiritually, but it's harmed us in the world. That's interesting. So why do you think that there has been such a captivation among Jews of the Marxist philosophy i guess Karl marx was a jew but he wasn't he was certainly an atheist um certainly didn't believe in god um why what why has there been this act captivation uh well well first of all i just want to comment on marx marx was a christian um he was baptized as a as an infant and he actually was a devout christian who before he went into college and became a marxist <laughs> He actually, his first pamphlet was about the divinity of Jesus and about the Trinity. And he was, he went in as a devout Christian, came out as a Marxist, came out because he was influenced by people like Hegel and, and several other philosophers and began to develop the Marxist idea. Um, why are Jews so attracted to this? I stretch it back. I know this seems a bit simplistic, but I go back to the, um, the advent of a false messianic movement you know, that was headed up by Shabtai Zvi, a false messiah known as the Sabadians, in that um, he embraced an idea which was a corruption of Lurianic uh, Talmudic understanding. I think Luria was an honest rabbi, but some of his ideas would be corrupted. That somehow the best means to bring about a messiah in the world was to commit evil, to bring mankind to such a low level of depravity that the Messiah would have to come to redeem the world. And, you know, it, it's in a sense, the, the similar movement within Christianity would be Satanism. You know, this idea of inverting morality. I mean, the, the, the satanic mass inverts all of the holy elements of the Catholic mass, right? I mean, it turns the cross upside down. It does all of these things symbolically and literally. And in a sense, it's, it's an attempt to say, it's an anarchist attempt to say, 
that there is no logos, there is no structure of the universe that was created by God. We have to tear all of that down. We have to tear down the Torah. We have to tear down the cross. And we have to create a, a situation of such chaos and anarchy that God will come and redeem the world. This was the basic heresy of Shatez V. And he, uh, I mean, look, the, on, the, on the other hand, he did launch a modern Zionist movement, which I think is good, but his intentions were not good. He was engaged, he wanted to overthrow the Torah. He wanted to claim that everything the Torah stood for was the opposite. And that's how he behaved in his life. And his movement, uh, after he was exposed as a fraud by the Turkish Sultan in 1666 um, and exposed, his movement went underground and they began to sort of shape shift that they would become Muslim or they become Christian and then they become Jewish and then they go back to Muslim. And they began to conduct what can be called an antinomian idea, the idea that um, all the world should be one religion, everybody should be the same. Uh, you know, that, that the ideal was to tear down conventional, both moral and conventional notions of existence. That, you know, things like property and, and uh, family and sovereignty, these things were, you know, oppressive. They were forms of uh, exploitation, as Marx would later say. Okay. So that's interesting. I, do you, I mean, to my knowledge, from my reading of the, the false messiah of this period, there were quite a number of Jews who followed him at the time before he was exposed. Is that correct? And that, was there a strong influence over time yes. then? Yeah, that is correct. They, he, what, he did garner a huge following in Europe, even among non-Jews, by the way. I mean, it was just a, it was a messy, he was a charismatic figure. You know, he kind of traveled around with this entourage. It's similar to, it reminds me of the Grateful Dead or somebody, or the, maybe, um, you know, he was like Mick Jagger, you know, he would get up and he would gyrate, he had a great singing voice, he was very attractive. He had a huge cult following in the world. And, you know, it was like a phenomena in a way. And yeah, a lot of Jews went, you know, got sucked up into it. I mean, I think there was a lot of un unpleasantness going on at the time. This was at the time of the Chamelniki raids from the uh, steppes of Ukraine, where a lot of Jewish villages were, were destroyed and there was terrible atrocities. And there was a lot of questioning within Judaism at that time. You know, in a way it's similar to some of the more orgiastic and extreme elements of the Protestant movement. I mean, E. Michael Jones gets into this in one of his books, it's pretty interesting, that people really felt that this, this idea of tearing down the entire social order would bring about some kind of an ecstatic messianic experience, which they misinterpreted in, from basic texts. And uh, so his movement did take, you know, t have a huge impact. When he was exposed, there was a lot of consternation within Judaism and most people, 98% of Jews walked away from it. And there was a lot of disgrace. And there was, some of this is actually covered by um, the fictional author, Isaac Besheva Singer in his book, Satan and Gore where he talks about the influence of Shatez V on a, on a, on a Polish village. And uh, afterward, there was an element that went underground called the Sabadians, who in the, in, the, in the de facto sense, not necessarily literally, developed a secret society. They, they were like, you know, they, they didn't want to be exposed to Jews because they would have been excommunicated and that there was almost a civil war that went on for the next century between the rabbis and this sect. And one of their disciples was Jacob Frank, who started the Frankist movement. It was very similar, just as bad, probably worse. And that uh, you had great rabbis like Rabbi Jacob Emden and others who stood up against this and fought against it in the story that really needs to be told. But they had a huge impact on Judaism operating in the shadows. And they, uh, they, they really led to an atmosphere, which I think set the stage for the corruption of communism and not, and um, well, I was gonna say Nazism, but they probably would have been Nazis if they weren't so anti-Semitic. There's more just communism and Marxism that would come maybe a century or two later.
So is this uh, sort of underground sect that still has some influence that there's a civil war going on. I, so are you saying that in the past 200 years or so, that that wing of Judaism has sort of gained the upper hand? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am saying that. Okay. And so I, I try to do what I can to expose it. But yes, I yeah. do think that, no, I don't mean necessarily literally in that there is a Sabadian secret society. I don't know that. Um, but I do think that they have permeated what we call the Jewish establishment in the world, um, organizations, I'll name them by name, the ADL and other groups, which are, seem to be antithetical toward Jewish faith and belief and the covenant between God and Israel. I mean, they, don't, they, they might be interested in, in helping the Jewish people, which I applaud them for because they do expose anti-Semitism, but nevertheless, as a matter of, 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 of theo theocratic belief, they are much more resembling the, uh, the Sabadians and their modern manifestations. Do you think that Catholics and Jews can unite on a social front against Marxism and this sort of other wing of Judaism, which is sort of Marxist or left wing? Yes, I mean, I think we can unite the Orthodox Jews. I mean, the Jews like myself absolutely could find common cause with with Catholicism, absolutely, um, and, and probably certain elements of Protestantism as well. Yeah, I believe that there was the the Legion of Decency in the early twentieth century. I believe there was Jewish involvement at that time, which was really against some of the Jews that were in Hollywood, more of the left wing type. So, um, right. I think there's there's certainly precedent for that sort of social cooperation. Um, wrapping up here, Charles, thanks so much for coming on the show. Tell us about your book, God is God. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a bit of a departure for me because most of my books are political books. They, I've written a book on economy. I've written a book on uh, politics. I wrote a book on Judaism. I wrote a book on Islam. I mean, I've done different uh, subjects, but to actually delve into a religious topic was uh, just a, a real experience for me and it was actually turned out to be a, a spiritual experience for me actually one that I didn't expect but uh, I basically look at the fact that God is the king of the universe and that there is no contradiction between that conception and science that this idea that there is a separation is false and that uh, you know the creation of the universe didn't just happen out of nothing ex nihilo as the Latin term goes that something had to happen in order for there to be something. Um, and that is described in the book of creation. And that something can only be a supernatural something, something outside of nature. I mean, many of the, uh, the new age movement, uh, some of the Masonic elements of, of society, perhaps certain degrees of Eastern religions, they tend to believe that everything just exists forever everything, there is no beginning, there is no creation, and there's no end. And thus, they tend to be more toward the idea that um, we're all the same, ultimately. I think that Judaism says that there was a moment of creation. And I would suggest that science indicates that there was a moment of creation. It is completely consistent. And that that moment of creation is, was triggered by, by God. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, any final thoughts on uh, Judaism? Any of the subject we've covered here, Charles? Well, I mean, Tim, thanks so much for having me on. I, I, I pray for uh, the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for the, all of us to, uh, to, to be closer in our personal walk with God. And I think that if we look within and we know God and we listen to our own voice, we will have a much more clear understanding of what is true. And that is very important, especially in these times when we are surrounded by more and more lies. Excellent. Yes, definitely focusing on what is true when there are more and more lies. I can certainly agree wholeheartedly with that, Charles. So Charles, so th thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything with us. Uh, you can get Charles' book, below that's linked below god is god thank you many of his other books are at his website also linked below lots of great anti-communist books i know catholics can certainly 
uh, wholeheartedly agree with the anti-communist stance that you take. And we appreciate well, the Catholic that, Church was on the forefront of that moral fight. I yes. mean, it, 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 it's uh, amazing. It's, it was indispensable. Thank you, Charles. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll wrap up here. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Stay strong. God bless. Oh.